If you're watching this video, you might have just heard about the announcement of the most distant galaxy ever found. Uh, and you might be wondering, uh, how far is it really? What does it mean uh, for something to be this distant from us? What does it look like? And uh, how do we know it really is what we think it is? Uh, and hopefully in this video I will answer some of these questions and go into the science that went into discovering this very rare galaxy a little bit. Uh, so its name, uh, the full name, is Max 1149. Uh, nicknamed JD1. This galaxy is at a redshift uh, of 9.11. That means that the light that came from this galaxy, when it was emitted, by the time it reached us, has been stretched to more than 10 times its original length. It has lost more than 10 times the energy it started with. This, this light has travelled through the universe uh, for 13.2 uh, billion years. So to put that into perspective, uh, if this is a timeline of the universe, uh, with the Big Bang at the start, uh, and us at the end today, uh, let's say that on this scale, life on Earth has appeared around here. This is linear in time. Uh, and the Sun and the Earth formed around about here, more or less. Uh, well, this galaxy, JD1, uh, is located all the way over here. This is how old it is. Uh, if you think about it, uh, this galaxy formed so little time after the Big Bang um, that uh, at the time that the stars composing it were, were sending light in all directions, some of this light uh, was traveling towards the direction uh, where the Earth would one day be. But of course, when the light set off on its travel towards where the Earth would be, the Earth had not even formed. Life certainly hadn't. Even the Sun wasn't there yet. Uh, but perhaps most impressive, uh, you might know that uh, atoms other than hydrogen uh, are made by the fusion uh, of hydrogen in the core of stars uh, through a process where some gas collapses into uh, a new generation of stars, and then the stars die in supernovae, and the remains of this gas go back into uh, to make another cloud and pollute the gas more and more. Uh, now the atoms in your body, uh, we believe, have gone through this cycle about two or three times. That means that at the time where this light set off to where the Earth would one day be and humans to catch it, uh, not even the atoms in your body existed yet. That is how long ago this light was emitted. Another interesting fact about this galaxy uh, is that it is located at a straight line distance uh, or what cosmologists call co-moving uh, of 30.8 billion light years. Now you might be wondering how is that possible? Uh, how can the galaxy be 30 billion light years away uh, if the universe itself is only 13.7 uh, billion years old. And the, the answer to this is a wonderful process uh, called cosmic expansion. That is to say, the space in between us and our galaxy has expanded many times um, between the time the light got through it and the present day. So this distance is how far the galaxy is from us at the moment, right this second. And the best analogy I have for this uh, is if you're trying to cross a corridor, you're trying to, uh, to get from point A to point B, but as you run across, you are shrinking compared to the corridor. So you might get quite far while you are still big. You might think, oh, this is going okay. But then as you get closer and closer to the other end, you're going to become smaller and smaller. So. From your perspective, you're always running at your maximum speed, but by the time you get to the end, you might turn back and, being all small, look back and think, oh, there's no way I could have crossed all of this in only this amount of time. Uh, but of course, the reason for that is that you got through most of it uh, when you were going much faster compared to the corridor, even though from your perspective, you were always running as fast as possible. Uh, and this is exactly what cosmic expansion is. So if you are within the universe, if you are, say, a galaxy or the Earth, the universe is expanding around you in all directions. But relatively speaking, this is the same 
as to say you are shrinking compared to the universe, just as you are shrinking compared to the corridor. And if you are trying to measure the distance once you are really small, all the way to the start, it will seem like an impossibly long distance, even though actually you haven't been traveling for that long. Now let's talk about the discovery itself a little bit. Uh, it involves a lot of people over many different countries, uh, many different continents, many different institutions. Uh, and in total, uh, 24 people, researchers, are credited for the discovery of JD1. Uh, the lead author is called Takuya Hashimoto. And actually, most of the team uh, is Japanese. So out of these 24 researchers, 15 are from Japan, from a total of eight different universities. Four of them are from the UK in UCL. Uh, and uh, one researcher is from France, one from Germany, one from Chile, and one from the US. So, uh, these four people are the ones I'm the most familiar with, because I work in the same team as them. So our team uh, consists of Professor Richard Ellis, who is uh, funding all of us. And we are very happy about that. Uh, as well as three full-time researchers. Uh, my colleagues Koki Kakishi and Nicolas Laporte, who is the second author uh, on this paper, having analyzed uh, the data uh, that, that led to the discovery, in a, in a large, a large fraction of it was done by him. Uh, and we also have uh, two PhD students um, called Tom Fletcher and uh, Romain Meilleur. We also have a half-funded, uh, well, partially funded uh, PhD student called Guido, who is also funded by someone else. And we have a visiting, uh, a visiting researcher called uh, Kimihiko Nakajima. Out of all these people, uh, the ones that were involved in making the discovery are Richard, uh, Nicholas, uh, as well as uh, two of the students, uh, Tom and Guido. This is a big a break for them, probably uh, the most media attention they have gotten uh, in their career so far. Uh, if you're wondering why the rest of us are not involved in the discovery, well, it's, it's basically because we didn't do uh, we didn't do enough work on it uh, to be to be worth worth to be included. Also, uh, we joined the team a bit too late when most of the work was already done. That's what I was saying. Uh, th these people move around a lot. These are only uh, approximate affiliations. I mean, it's like we, we know what country people are from, it's just that they move around so much because the contracts are so short uh, that this, all these affiliations become wrong really fast. <laughs> now let's get into uh, how we know that this is a galaxy and how we know how far it is. Uh, so the kind of light that galaxies emit is made from many, many stars. Uh, and stars, uh, because they are hot, radiate what we call black body radiation. The black body radiation is the most uh, 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 the most common form of radiation in the universe. As soon as something is heated, it emits black body radiation, uh, which peaks at some color or some wavelength, uh, and then decreases on both sides. So, for example, uh, you can have a, a big hot blue star. Uh, will have a black body radiation that might look like this, uh, while a middle-aged star like the sun, or middle size, medium power, will have a black body that is shifted to less powerful wavelengths. And uh, even smaller stars have black bodies shifted even more. Uh, now, if you add the contributions from all the stars in the galaxy, you will get uh, an envelope that goes around all of these, and then falls off a bit. Uh, and this falling off uh, over here is what we call um, well, it's what we call the 4000 angstrom break uh, slash Balmer break. They're not exactly the same thing, but more or less, for our purposes, they are. Uh, and the mode of different kinds of, gal of, of stars you have in a galaxy, how strong this break is, uh, will change. For ex because uh, ev having even a few young stars will boost this and make it look 
less steep. Well, if all the blue stars have died off, uh, and you have a lot more of these stars, it's going to look like a, a sharper drop, something like this. Right, so this is important. So if I am going to if I zoom out uh, on the same diagram, I have the same wavelength, I have the same uh, energy in each type of light, so from blue to red. But now I'm going to extend this to the left, and we're going to have something that's like this, and one break, and then up again. Okay. So now this corresponds to this, more or less. So we have this uh, this bump, which is the stars, and then past this bump there is this uh, uh, what we call the UV excess. Uh, basically, it doesn't just drop and then stays down forever. The stars are not the only contributor. Uh, you get some UV light being emitted by rare, rarer events, uh, mostly star binaries. Um, so in lo in the local universe, this is the basic template for a galaxy spectrum. Uh, how much you have of this, whether it's over here or whether it's over here, uh, will tell you something about the number of binaries, and how sharp the break is tells you about what types of stars and how many stars there are, depending on the total shape. Uh, now, uh, once you get uh, to the early universe, you're going to notice that everything below some number here uh, is uh, cut off, destroyed completely. None of it gets through. So this becomes a problem above redshift 6, and it's what we call the Lyman break. Uh, and this is due uh, to actually the universe itself being opaque. So on the way from um, the Big Bang uh, to the stars forming, the universe was a lot more dense, and it becomes less and less dense uh, as we get closer to stars forming. But even after, after the first stars are formed, the actual gas which fills the universe uh, is not uh, transparent yet. Not to all wavelengths, anyway. These wavelengths are stopped just by the fog which is in the universe. The universe is foggy at times before this. And this is what we observe when we find distant galaxies or distant quasars or distant anything, that there is nothing left of this threshold. So you get a very sharp step. Where all of that is missing. And this is a very characteristic shape. It's very brutal. And as far as we know, there is nothing else uh, that can make make it look like this. Nothing uh, that could absorb quite so much light to the point that none of it gets through. So this Lyman break uh, is really a characteristic of the early universe, and this is exactly what we search for. Right, so now that we know what, what kind of thing we are looking for, uh, we're going to try to identify some good candidates. So the this, this spectrum that I showed you earlier, from less powerful and more powerful on the left, now has this very sharp drop, this is almost flat there, and it just dies off completely. So this is the kind of light that is getting through the fog to us from the galaxy. So what we're going to do is um, go to our uh, favorite large telescope, in this case Hubble, and we are going to put in front of our telescope uh, like a filter, like a colored filter that only lets one type of light through at a time. So we might put a green filter, or a blue filter, uh, or a red filter, uh, or all the, all the visible lights that you can think of. Uh, even even colors that you cannot see. You can even go further to, uh, to infrared colors. Because that way, we are only letting through light of, of that single color. So what we are going to be looking for uh, is galaxies that are not detected in any color except red. So when, we t when you take the picture using a blue filter, you are going to see nothing. There will be no galaxy there. Same for green. Uh, but when you get to red and to infrared, then you should be able to see the object and it should be quite bright. And that's exactly what is uh, here in this, uh, in this older paper from 2012. Uh, this is from the Hubble Space Telescope. And you can see that in the optical light, uh, there is no galaxy in the circle. In this color, there is no galaxy there. All these circles are empty. And then suddenly you cross into here and bam, super bright thing. This is an object which you can only notice if you put a, a color filter that blocks all lights except red. Uh, and this is how the ga this galaxy was first selected as a very strong candidate uh, for, uh, for follow-up. Uh, because, of course, even though this break uh, seems very sharp, it's a very rare feature. Uh, there are some candidates that, after they are selected like this, 
uh, they might still fail. So there, there are some very, very weird things in the universe that can mimic as this. I think the, the biggest contaminant is um, particularly nearby and particularly hot brown dwarves can look like this sometimes. Those are very rare too, <laughs> which is a problem. Uh, but usually people make large lists of uh, candidates for these things, and then you have to confirm it, but we'll get to that in a second. Now we have another problem, that uh, these galaxies are way too faint. So it, uh, it, it's a real problem. If you remember my running across the hallway while, while shrinking analogy, uh, if you were dropping things at regular intervals, uh, uh, for you it would sound like the same interval of time, but in terms of interval of space it's a lot more, because you're going a lot faster at the start. Uh, and for, for this reason and many others, it turns, it, it turns out that uh, this, this galaxy is a hundred times fainter than it would appear if it was only one-tenth of the way to us, so it scales um, with the square, more or less. Uh, so they are incredibly faint. And if you just target the entire sky with these color bands and hope to find them, you know, you're not gonna get, you're not gonna get them past some distance, they become just too faint. Uh, so instead of just targeting the entire sky, we use a trick. A good trick given to us by general relativity, which is gravitational lensing. It turns out if you have a, an object behind a star and it's sending light, uh, the mass of the star is bending spacetime and it's going to make the, the light from the object bend. This is a very, very exaggerated representation. And this is actually uh, how general relativity was first proven. One of the very first uh, proofs of general relativity uh, was that. Uh, um, Sir Arthur Eddington was looking at the patch of sky. I'm going to draw this bigger. He was looking at the patch of sky and he had uh, made a map of all the stars that were in it. Kind of like this. And then he, uh, he packed his telescopes. He travelled to Africa. He travelled to Africa for a specific reason, because uh, a few days later the sun was in the, was in the frame. So here, where, where before there was only the sky, suddenly the, the sun was in the way of the stars. Uh, but, uh, of course, if the sun is there, you can't see anything because it's too bright, but uh, uh, the moon was also there, so it, it was a total eclipse. So this, in this way, he could see how the mass of the sun was bending the light of the stars, but he could still see the stars. So that's, that's pretty handy. Uh, and he noticed that the stars that were far away from the sun had not moved, but the ones that were close enough to be bent in this way were way off. He observed them way over here. Uh, and actually the amount they were shifted by uh, was exactly what GR predicted and it was much more uh, than any other theory predicted. So that's good. And that's what we call gravitational lensing, is this bending of light. Uh, now I want to say as an aside, uh, right, gravitational lensing is a, is a bit of a misnomer. Uh, even the guy who, uh, who came up with the name, I can't remember what his name was, uh, he came up with the name, and then he said, of course, you shouldn't draw a comparison uh, with normal lensing with lenses, uh, because a normal lens, if you have a source over here and it goes through the lens, it has what we call a focal point. Uh, all the light after the lens joins back again. Uh, and with gravitational lensing, that's not the case. So if you have um, a gravitational lens, say a big blob of matter, the, the light that gets close to it is going to be bent a lot, like this, and the light that gets far away is going to be bent less, like this. So you end up with uh, a focal line instead. And that means that you're the importance of this is that your intuition about optics uh, will not apply to gravitational lenses. They work in, a, in very, very strange ways. That you really need general relativity to model them properly. So why is this relevant to finding faint galaxies? Well, imagine you have a bunch of galaxies, uh, a big cluster, like big elliptical galaxies, big, big things, uh, somewhere in the universe. Now, the matter around it extends past these galaxies. They're all surrounded by big halos of both matter and dark matter. Uh, and uh, let's say that the total mass profile is something like this. It's a strange potato shape. Now, if you have a very faint source at the back, all the rays of light it emits are going to be bent in slightly different ways. Some are going to escape fine, some are going to be deflected a bit, and some are going to follow strange paths through this matter. Because it's not only a sphere, and you really need 
full general relativity to model this properly. Uh, but some of them will have these uh, very rare, very lucky paths uh, through these things to us. And now, thanks to something called Liouville's theorem, uh, which is maths for the surface density of light has to remain constant. Uh, that means that right, the surface density of light has to remain constant. So uh, it cannot be diluted just because what you see is bigger. So lensing uh, says, tells you that your, your, cross co your cross section can change how big the thing is on the sky. Uh, but Liouville's theorem tells you that the brightness cannot change. So let's think about this for a second. Uh, it means that you can have a source in the background which is absolutely tiny and you don't, you don't get a lot of photons from it. Say that your, your telescope aperture is something like this and you're counting all the photons you can from the source and you're just not getting enough, it's just too faint. Well, if, it's, it, if it happens to be in one of these sweet spots uh, where it gets amplified by gravitational lensing, this is the same telescope aperture and was bad at drawing. Uh, this, this will be, it might be way bigger and like way distorted maybe, but the surface density will be the same. Only for some very, very specific spots. Those spots are very rare. Uh, but thankfully, we have enough of these big clusters uh, to do a big search with the Hubble telescope, which is very powerful. So that's exactly uh, what uh, what uh, people did. This is how the how JD1 was first identified. If you imagine that your cluster is over here, let's say it's all like quite flat compared to us, and we are here. Uh, then here are all your galaxies in the cluster, and uh, there will be a a sweet spot area. So that if you are in this sweet spot the light that you are sending towards the Earth will get super boosted. It won't, ha it won't happen for all the sources behind the cluster, it won't happen at all distances, it will ha happen in a very, very specific sweet spot. And the sweet spot for each cluster is absolutely tiny. So instead, what, um, uh, what this paper I have on the left did, um, a paper by uh, Wei Zhang from 2012, is that with Hubble, they targeted many, many, many clusters. So here are some clusters. And they all have uh, their own sweet spot at the back. And it might be linear, it might be potato shaped, it might even be like this. Uh, but if a galaxy uh, at, this, at this distance, very, very far, if one of them just happens to be in one of these sweet spots, it will get super boosted like this. And we will see it like 10 or 20 times more bright than we would if it wasn't super boosted. So this is really the only way we currently have of being able to see these things. Just looking for them directly uh, is not currently possible. Uh, and even so, uh, so, so this, this paper by Wei Zheng, uh, they targeted 25 clusters, 25 uh, big clusters, uh, uh, and, and they only found uh, one candidate, one plausible candidate, which they thought was worthy of follow-up. So even covering all of these available uh, sweet spots, there was only one. All right, so now that we have identified uh, a very likely candidate, it is time to go for confirmation to prove that this thing could not be anything other than a high redshift galaxy. Uh, so if you remember this diagram I had, again, um, so it was th this galaxy was detected in some colors, that is red and infrared, well, not red, this was all in infrared, uh, and undetected in all other bands. Now, there are, there are a range of possible galaxies that could go through here. So you could have a galaxy that, that does this, so you could shift it a bit and it could be like this, uh, or it could peak like this. Well, you get, you get the point. Just with these points, you can only narrow down where this break is uh, between a redshift of 9 and 9.5. This is the range that we have. If you want to be more precise than that, you can just use colors. Uh, we have to use uh, emission lines. Now, emission lines are a, a tricky thing to explain, uh, but roughly speaking, uh, let's, uh, in, a, in a star, uh, there are a lot of, say, oxygen atoms. Oxygen is very, very common in stars. Uh, now, oxygen 
has some protons and neutrons surrounded by orbitals of electrons, rough, roughly like this. Um, now, because the star is so hot, the oxygen atom is not able to keep all of these electrons to himself. It keep, they keep being bombarded with UV light, with heat, uh, and all sorts of things that make these, these electrons lose, uh, like these electrons leave the oxygen atoms. So the average oxygen atom in a star is missing at least one, uh, but usually two or three electrons. Where they used to be, instead they have become free. So they're just, they're just flying around. Uh, and they, they can't be captured because there's, there's just too much uh, chaos going on. So uh, they can be captured and uh, escape again in, this, in a sort of balanced fashion. So we, we, can, we call these oxygen free and oxygen two, depending on how many electrons they are missing. Uh, and because of this constant absorbing and freeing of electrons, these two are going to exist in some sort of uh, harmony, some sort of balance between the two, uh, depending on how much they can retain and how much they can lose. Um, and if there is too much heat around or too much UV light around, uh, even these can't exist. They will lose even more. So you will have oxygen 4, oxygen 5, and so on. Uh, but these matter to us uh, specifically uh, uh, because uh, they are what, what helped us identify JD1. So in this exchange of electrons, uh, everything is done by exchanging particles of energy called photons. So we are now in the realm of quantum mechanics, yay. Uh, this warrants a whole video on itself, but the point is uh, that this exchange of energy, the exchange of electrons, can only happen uh, at a specific, uh, with specific pockets of energy. So you can think of these, uh, you know, as a uh, money. I guess you only have some denominations of, of things. Even if you want to trade a big energy between going from this to this to this back again. Uh, you can only do it uh, in some fixed numbers. And, and these fixed numbers are the wavelengths of emission and absorption lines. In this case, it's an emission line because the balance means that there's more emission than absorption in that particular packet. Uh, so in other words, uh, this, some of these packets are overrepresented compared to all other types of light because they don't come from the black body radiation of a star. They come from one specific atom going through this process uh, of ionization and quantum mechanic decay. And that can only be done in fixed numbers. So for example, the one that, uh, that we used here is a line called oxygen free. It has a wavelength of 88 microns when it is emitted. So that means that within our range of redshift between 9 and 9.5, we should be able to observe it. It is expected between eight, 880 and 930 micrometers, more or less. Uh, so if we point our telescope at this specific range in frequency, uh, and we see uh, a big boost, like a big specific line, exactly where we expect it, uh, if these stars contain any oxygen, uh, which they do, uh, if there's a line exactly there, we'll have confirmation that this galaxy uh, is most likely real. Uh, so that is what uh, this discovery is all about. Uh, this O3 line we want to look for uh, with the infrared interferometer ALMA, and we found it. Not only that, but in a very similar way, a different line called Lyman Alpha, which is due to hydrogen, we want to look for with uh, the big um, well, UV visible and infrared uh, spectrograph X-shooter, and it was there too, exactly in the range where you would expect it to be. Uh, and then uh, we all celebrated, because uh, this is, uh, this is uh, sufficient proof uh, that this thing is definitely a high redshift galaxy. There is definitely nothing uh, in the universe that we can think of which would also have these same lines at the exact location where you expect them if they were due to stars, but redshifted by a factor of more than 10 in exactly the right fraction compared to each other. That is too much uh, coincidence for this to be anything else. Uh, and we are extremely happy about this because now we can do all sorts of fun science with this galaxy. Now that we know that it is real, we can start to interpret what all the features that we saw meant uh, with reasonable confidence. Right, so this is the same plot yet again. 
not detected in these, detected kind of in these. And in addition, uh, we got an extra band uh, in the infrared, all the way over here, like this. Uh, and thanks to that, and because we know exactly where this break is supposed to be now, because we have the redshift from these lines, and these lines are very, very narrow, I can show you to them on the left, because the paper will only be public tomorrow. Uh, but because we know exactly where it is, now we can fit this with only one very specific star content. So this boost over here, and actually we have uh, four bands here, so uh, we have one more. This boost here has a very uh, exciting and unexpected shape. So this, this Balmer break, if you remember, this is, this is the part which is uh, just the sum of all the stars in this galaxy. Uh, and uh, what, what we found is that this Balmer break is really sharp. Uh, so if you remember from earlier, if the, if the break is really sharp, that means that the very younger stars, the really, really hot ones, have already died off. Uh, uh, so that means that this galaxy, even though it is so close to the Big Bang, already has some stars which are old. And I don't mean old. What do I mean by old? Uh, old in this context. They only have to be uh, 290 million years old, because after this time, the really bright ones will start to die. And, it, and the galaxy has a dust content, so um, uh, the products of, of when stars die, the things that get ejected, uh, the, the amount of dust is also consistent with this. So there is one population right here, which is creating this, uh, this really sharp Balmer break, which is only consistent in our current models with a reasonably old stellar population. And if we go to the timeline of the of the universe, so I'm going to I'm going to go here just between the Big Bang and the first billion years. We observe this galaxy at around at around here, 550 more or less million years after the Big Bang. Uh, and these these uh, stars are 290 million years old, so they must have formed all of these uh, were young around back here at around 250 million years after the Big Bang. And that is extremely significant. Why? Uh, because based on the temperature of the universe and all our models of, of uh, galactic assembly, forming stars in the universe should only be possible starting at around 200 uh, million years after the Big Bang. Before that, the universe is just too hot. There hasn't been enough time. It hasn't been cold enough. The things have not uh, uh, condensed enough to make stars. Uh, so if you plot how much, ga how much stars this galaxy has made per year, this is stars made per year, on the same scale as this uh, Big Bang scale, it made none, it had a big burst around, around this time, and then these stars just aged slowly, and not many were made since then. And this is when we observe it. So, in other words, uh, we're not sure about this, but it is very possible that some of the old stars here, old quotation marks, that were made back here, just after making stars should have become possible, they could be uh, the first gen, the first gen of stars to ever form in the universe. And then we would uh, really have reached the limits of what is observable, because before then, there is just nothing to see. Uh, and finally, what does this all mean? Uh, why, why are uh, how, are, how are galaxies different in the past than they are today? What does this tell us about how galaxies became the way we see them today? Uh, well, in the most accepted model, this arrow represents time, uh, you start off with only tiny, tiny blobs of stars. They're not galaxies to speak of. They are distributed all across the universe. Every one of the universe is slightly too dense. You get these little blobs. Uh, and then some of these blobs might combine to give slightly bigger blobs, like so, or even tinier blobs. And some will not be affected for, for a long time. And then as time goes on, uh, so, uh, these blobs and some of the remaining blobs uh, will start to form spiral galaxies, which are formed when these blobs collide and they kind of miss, so they start having some rotational pull. Uh, so spiral galaxies should be uh, formed reasonably early, while some of these blobs don't evolve very much. 
Uh, and now, if you are uh, if you are in a not very dense part of the universe, these blobs might survive even today. We see uh, some very very small galaxies, not made of this first generation because stars die and they are reborn many many times along this line, um, and some um, spiral galaxies also stop assembling at this stage. Uh, and then if you are in a very dense part of the universe, you might get uh, many, many spiral galaxies colliding together and make uh, what we call a red and dead elliptical, because they go through their resources really fast. These are the galaxies we see today, the three types of galaxies that you will see if you look up in the local universe. Uh, and as we go back in time, as we look at galaxies of higher and higher redshift, this is the order that you see them disappearing, so to speak. So Red ellipticals are not uh, a very active or ongoing, ongoing formation about halfway across the history of the universe. If you go beyond that, uh, they, they don't even uh, exist. You get big uh, dense over densities of galaxies, but they are not this big. And, uh, and they tend to have uh, some spiral structure or be rotating blobs in the process uh, of building up like this. And then if you go really far, like to the redshifts uh, of JD1, redshifts of uh, 8, 9, and above, uh, then you only see blobs. These are the things that, that the only thing that you see. They're all very small. They're all very blob-like. So you can see in in this picture uh, I have on the on the top left, uh, it's not a spiral because we don't see spirals at this epoch. Uh, as if by coincidence, all the galaxies which are very redshifted, very distant, uh, all look like fuzzy blobs. They might be rotating, but they don't seem to have a lot of spiral arms yet. They don't look like the ones we see today. They don't have the same masses, they don't have the same sizes. Uh, this is how we are really able to say that uh, the, at larger and, and larger redshifts as we go, we are really starting to see the universe uh, as it was at the beginning. And hopefully as we keep pushing the redshift barrier, we will confirm more and more of this first generation of stars. Uh, because in a way, once you reach the very first stars, there is no point going any further. There will not be any more astrophysical objects for uh, researchers to, to enjoy pointing telescopes at. Anyway, uh, I hope you have uh, all enjoyed this video. Please like and share. This is a young channel. Uh, and I will see you guys uh, next time. Bye.